So I, I think it's a uh, very, very simple story. I <coughs> there's only one thing I know since my, my working life and that's storage. And so I guess it's pretty natural for me to come back and address something that I've lived with for about 20, 25 years on different facets of the uh, table. Uh, I was a typical young engineer. I went on to be a large company executive. I went on to be a VC for a while, uh, did some startups, and all common theme throughout the whole thing was about the storage world. So when we look back as, a, as an investor, looking at investment theme around uh, one of those disruptive themes you're thinking about, <coughs> there are a few things that stand out over the last, I would say, five, 10 years, and this is in 2008 now. Uh, we saw a big change in, I think, some of the stuff you're talking about, big change in how IT is delivered. We saw a big change in how people use computing resources. And with the emergence of uh, models like the SaaS models, this whole notion of how consumers consume and the death of the box, basically. Uh, the whole idea of uh, a box <coughs> being something that you, you consumed, you bought, slowly became as old as uh, the mainframe business. So we looked at those three big paradigms and found an opportunity to come back and create uh, a disruptive environment where we decouple uh, what you do with your data versus where you store it. The old model was there was a box, it came with a few knobs, and if you wanted more of those knobs, you found more boxes. And that's, that's the way the business ran. And I think you know, your Microsoft Office example is a perfect one. There was no shared model. There was no ability to separate out uh, what I really paid for from a value perspective versus you know, the junk that has to come with the value. And so that was the basis for how we came back and tried to come, back, come up with a, a model that, that separated out what was truly important for the business from what was truly a commodity and come up with this unified uh, data management model. So I think that was, that was a starting point for the discussion. And uh, uh, having been steeped in the industry for a long time, or some people call me probably jaded in the industry for a long time. I think the toughest part was to get out of our own shell and say, well, that's how I used to do it 15 years ago. Surely it must be working fine because we have companies that, that have you know, 20, 40 billion dollar market caps building around this model. And that's probably the toughest part is to get out of your own mold of what you knew and really look at the discontinuity from a position of strength rather than just a position of comfort. I think what makes Ash unique is that he is he is, he's really someone who developed intimate familiarity with a business problem. That was the way enterprises store and manage their data. And um, Ash built a company a while ago called AppIQ. Uh, he started off as an engineer, actually. He built, like, all the way down to the metal, built software and applications uh, that were behind uh, some very important storage products, and then left to start a company called AppIQ, and eventually sold that to HP and became the head of the storage division at, at HP, um, which used to be a very important company. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so what's interesting about Ash is, is that he, he really developed a very intimate familiarity with a business problem, that being how enterprises store and manage their data. And he's really built a career kind of applying successive generations of technology against that problem. Anyway, the Actifio story really starts with that. Intimate familiarity with a <laughs> scaled enterprise problem related to, to data management and, um, and maybe the ability to, to apply some new technology in solving that problem. All right, so who here feels like they have a pretty good handle on what Actifio does? Who here understands what Actifio does pretty well? Okay. All right. How many were there? One. <laughs> Can you talk to me? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Great positioning tells a story, okay? Um, we all want a story. Um, we don't want a slide, we want a story. Um, and the way that we explain Actifio to people like yourselves today um, is with an analogy. So who here has a smartphone? All right, when you take a picture with that phone, you create a one meg file, okay? If you're an Apple user, PhotoStream is going to do you the kindness of sending that to your iPad and your laptop. And so now your one meg file is consuming three megs of storage across devices and in the cloud. If you send that to Instagram and it bounces out to your Twitter and Facebook accounts, your one meg photo is now consuming six megs of storage across those multiple devices. Okay? 
Now, the exact same thing happens in the enterprise. Um, you have all those systems that Ash described in those initial slides, and they're all making copy after copy of what's in production without knowing what copies already exist. Backup makes a copy, snapshot, disaster recovery, all these different systems. The big difference with my analogy is that instead of a one meg photo, this might be a 10 terabyte Oracle database. And it's now consuming 60 terabytes of data across the enterprise. Around the world, this is a $44 billion problem. It represents 60% of the money that customers spend on disk capacity, drives 65% of their storage software spending, and accounts for 85%, the vast majority of their hardware. Businesses are spending much more to manage copies of their data than they are to manage their data, and we think this is crazy. Who understands what Actifio does now? Okay, that is marketing. You know, it's important to make the distinction uh, between two very different phases of, uh, of a startup. So this is my sixth uh, time involved in something, you know, um, that hadn't connected with the marketplace to, to, uh, uh, to sort of shepherd it through that process. And before that point, what, what you, the lean startup guys call it product market fit, um, you, have a, uh, you have a need. And that need is really just to get to a place where you have uh, an hypothesis that is good enough to sell. Uh, this stage of a business has, you know, uh, a strategy that needs to be flexible. Right? You can't engrave your strategy in, in concrete um, before you, you really have connected with the marketplace when it's still something that you just fervently believe. Um, the product is an early stage product. Maybe you have you know, kind of the 1.0 version of it. Um, you are selling that to an early adopter customer. That's particularly true if you're selling in the enterprise tech space. Uh, but in almost all cases, you need someone willing to take a flyer on a new idea. Um, the engine of companies at this stage is acts of individual heroism. Uh, it's all-nighters to solve customer problems and get deals done, and, and that is just the lifeblood of a company at this stage of its development. And your real priority as an entrepreneur, the thing that you should be focused on, um, isn't getting to the end point, it's the speed um, at which you are refining your idea. Your priority is really rapid cycle refinement. Um, and the point of this slide is just that there were lots of technical innovations taking place in the storage industry. You had a move to uh, what they called thin provisioning, which was essentially a higher level of granularity in the way data was stored. Uh, you had uh, the advent of data deduplication, which is a reduction in some of the copies that data creates, at least at the end of the backup silo. Um, blah, blah, blah. Right? There were some technical changes that were happening in terms of the way that, that uh, storage was managed. And in the face of these technical challenges, customers were responding with a need for a simpler approach. And, and what they wanted were these things that are called today appliances. They are essentially single function storage devices. And over time, the confluence of these two things, new technologies enabling lots of new functions, and customers' affinity for simple devices that I could kind of plug and play into their networks, you ended up with this very complicated, multi-tiered system. Uh, all these little appliances, all these little toasters and kitchen things and, and devices that did one thing very well, and individually they were easy to kind of deploy um, and put in place, but the result, if you look down on the architecture as a whole, was this sort of um, you know, patchwork quilt of different solutions that really weren't designed to work together. So, um, you know, applying the framework to, to where uh, the company found itself in the early days, you know, I think that we did a pretty good job against the four U's, right, in terms of our value proposition. Um, there was really no way to solve this complexity problem with current technology, right? Cur current technology had evolved incrementally from the technology that preceded it because that's what, uh, that's in the interest of the status quo. Um, every uh, enterprise uh, with data to be accessed and protected had this problem because they had all these little issues to be dealt with, so it was, it was absolutely unavoidable. Um, it was urgent because what happened over time as data moved from, you know, megabyte to terabyte to now petabyte scale, companies were finding that more and more of their IT budgets were being consumed by checks they had to write to EMC for more and more spinning disk to store their crap. 
um, it was like the enterprise equivalent of like those like you know places where you store your stuff you know um, just imagine if you were paying more for that than you were for your rent that was happening in the that's what was happening in the ID department so there was great urgency to try and liberate resources from these more mundane storage capabilities and apply them against more strategic IT objectives and then finally um, the market was underserved uh, primarily because the big vendors all had a very concrete disincentive to tackle this problem in the way that served the customer. Um, you know, in the end, you know, the big companies were just buying more and more of these little, like, you know, uh, these little application companies, uh, these little uh, uh, um, organizations, and compiling them into these more and more complex um, iterative things. And with that complexity came the opportunity for services revenue, and everything was great. But this was the problem state as articulated by the company. And even though it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the problem, I think you know, we did a pretty good job. So again, look for the emotional driver of the behavior. Um, if you want to change what someone does, you have to change what they feel and not just what they think. OK, very important. You, you promised to expose the idea of Under Armour. Yeah. I mean, Under Armour is, is an amazing. You know, I, I, I have such respect for their business because who needed another company that made t-shirts, you know? Um, and um, uh, I was on another business trip a while ago and I was at like a fancy hotel and I go down to the gym to get on the treadmill and I'm literally the only person with a single article of cotton clothing in the entire like, you know, gym. And I felt like kind of, you know, middle-aged man. Um, that was an SNL skit 100 years ago. Um, but, uh, but, but it's amazing, really. They've, they've identified a market need of this high-performance athletic clothing, and they took something that was completely dead, you know, polyester and nylon-based things. Some new technology came along, better fabrics, and they built a brand that is like a monster brand uh, on the back of just addressing that need in a new way. And, and again, nobody needed new T-shirts, but they looked at the problem in a different way. Um, and, and, and that's how they built a business. We're, we were a little mixed on the black and white thing, I think. Um, geometric data growth, uh, unmet RTO, which is a recovery time objective. So you sign up for a service level agreement or SLA as the manager of one of these uh, IT organizations. And you, you, as a result, you, they say, well, if we go down, we only want to be down for 15 minutes. So your RTO is 15 minutes. And if you don't make your RTO, that is, that is you know, you're, you have your, your perfect sales process, which is a guy who gets fired if it doesn't work. Um, so, uh, petabyte scale, big data, I've talked a little bit about that. All those things were blatant and critical. And what we needed to create was a connection to this idea that I'll explain in a little bit called copy data as the root cause of that problem. Um, and um, um, when we came up with the right way to explain that idea, what we found was that customers embraced it. And it was only when we came up with a better way to to you know, communicate, to tell our story that the business really started to you know, take off at the level that, that uh, sort of defines it today. So we've, we found that white space in the market, but it was, it was white space that the market didn't know it had. Uh, we had to reframe the problem in a way that they could, they could see it. Yeah, and ha having the opportunity to, you know, many times um, you, know, you, can, you can change the, the way people think about a problem. Now, not, it's not manipulation. Like you need to reveal underlying truth to a customer. Right? Um, I think marketing gets a bad rap sometimes because um, people think it's sort of manipulative. And really, great marketing is revealing an underlying truth. It's one thing if you're coming to an industry you know nothing about, which was my, my huge advantage. Um, it takes real courage to um, change something inside the sort of, you know, the Gorbachev model. You know, you're, you're part of the system and then you decide to change it from within. Um, very difficult to do. So discontinuous innovation uh, really starts with the courage to break with the past. Um, and I talked earlier about some of the themes that Ash just uh, reiterated, which was uh, changes in the enabling technologies of storage and a customer affinity for these single function boxes and applications. Um, and I think early in the company's life, uh, Ash and David really made a decision that we're going to start with something uh, totally new, start with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, the cliche is actually true in our case. That's what they started with. Um, that led to the development of some defensible technology. So it started off with the architecture, a new way of solving the problem. Uh, we've invested a lot of time and, and other people's money um, in building up now a portfolio of 22 patents you know, in process, filed or pending, uh, in order to make this original idea real. 
right? There was a whole bunch of enabling stuff that needed to happen for us to uh, realize that original vision that happened on a you know, yellow line piece of paper. Um, and then what's come last was a, a way to sell that and price it in a way that is very difficult for our already public scaled competition to match. It would involve complex restatement of the way they do their financials and, and alter their cash flow model in a way that would make investors uh, unhappy. So, so for us, I think it's, it starts with that break. It starts with a better way. And I think after, after finding that, it's, it's years of work to go and do everything necessary to realize the vision on that piece of paper. Although to your credit, um, <coughs> Ash, I would say that right away from day one, you were willing to think about all of these 3Ds. Like, for example, I remember having discussions with you about disrupting what were traditional big box salespeople mm -hmm. by figuring out how to sell this as a service. Is that fair? Right. I think, well, I think, um, like I said, this is probably one of the most conservative markets. I mean, as much as we talk about disruption here, we, we had to be cognizant about how much friction there is between an idea and a business. And so, um, there was a, there's a lot more in terms of the thought process of what else could we make discontinuous and disruptive. But we took a lot of baby steps, but you're absolutely right. Now, right from the beginning, we looked at the models of what worked in the consumer industry. By the way, this is another big phenomenon, I think, that drove what we did. For the first time in 10 years, maybe maybe 15 <coughs> years ago, was, a, was when the consumer markets truly started driving technology and, and consumption models. Never happened before. It was usual enterprise guys. We were the smartest guys around but not anymore. And so we learned a lot. You know, it truly allowed the elephants to start dancing. And this was one of those things that uh, we learned a lot, kept trying to tune it at the speed at which the market could absorb. So phase two of the startup journey is, is, you, um, is the point at which you've corrupted your vision with the external reality. Right? You, you've, you've, you've proven out your hypothesis in the real world because you know, more than one person has paid you for it, um, uh, and, and there's a pattern in those dots. And that's a very different stage of the organization. Here you have a strategy that is much more stable than in phase one. Uh, you have a product that is maturing or, or uh, becoming, uh, it's reached a critical mass of maturity in the way it's consumed. Um, the customer is, you know, we think of it as kind of the ultra early majority, right? There's the old crossing the chasm and that's kind of where we are, is that we're on that front edge of just sort of clearing the, uh, um, the Grand Canyon there. Um, the engine is a combination of heroism and systems. I wish I could say it was all process and systems, but it's not. Um, it's a difficult stage of the company where you still have to do all the hero shit, but in your spare time you have to build systems and processes to make that unnecessary. Um, and it's a stressful time, costs you a lot of hair. Um, that's part of that. Uh, and then um, the priority really is, is just to make sure you're making happy customers in the world. Um, and, and I think that, that uh, in our company, that is job one. Like whatever you know, bumps and bruises we get along the way, because it's hard to make all this stuff work, we just want to make sure that, that we have happy customers, because that's really the foundation of the business going forward. All right, so I'm going to show you uh, the way that we tell that story at the next level of detail. These are like two or three slides from what we call our CXO deck. And what's interesting is like going through these with Michael, I'll be able to reinforce a lot of the ideas that we've shared. So, you know, our pitch really starts with this image um, and, and the observation that every business out there is dealing with an explosion in the amount of data that they need to manage. Um, that is the problem. That is the problem the, custom, the guy sitting in front of you has, is he's got a, a growth curve of his data that looks like this. And so what we help him understand is that um, the majority of that data is not production data. It's not data being produced by the systems that they use to run the business. It's data that is being produced by systems that make a copy of that data, right? Um, and I mentioned these metrics, right, 44 billion. Uh, 60%, 65, and 85. Now, the root cause of this is these siloed systems. In the beginning, there was backup, and backup was good, right? You got to back your stuff up. Um, backup wasn't fast enough at some point, though, and so people created separate systems to make snapshots of their production data. Separate systems copying the same data. Um, people wanted to take those snapshots and put them someplace else in case there was a smoking hole at headquarters and the disaster recovery market was born. 
People had a disaster. They couldn't get it back fast enough. They needed it faster. That's business continuity, separate systems. We have to make copies of data support application development. That's test and dev. And we need more copies to run our, our archives and do our analytics on. All right, so that's just the physical layer. Um, there's this whole virtual layer of technology as well. And that results in massive excess duplication, huge spending on infrastructure, all this operational complexity, and massive cost to make it all work together. All right, so this is just a, a simplified version of, of many of the themes that were in that original deck, but now brought to light in the context of a story that human beings you know, can wrap their head around. Um, so what Actifio did, the, the sort of innovation, was to start with a blank sheet of paper and say, look, you have your production data over here, and we're not going to touch that. What we're going to do is we're going to manage copy data. And we're going to do that by doing a full ingest of everything in your production environment. Not a point solution that adds to everything you have. We're going to, we're going to take a single copy of everything. And from that point forward, after that first ingest, we're only going to store and move a unique deduped version of, of whatever we don't have. Right? So I'm only capturing the changes after that initial snapshot. And I'm going to store that in such a way that I can spin up a virtual copy for any of those uses that you now manage separately. Um, and, and that's it. And the beauty of this is once you architect the system that way, you get to manage it all with a single application. Okay? Um, Actifio is radically simple copy data storage. That's what it is. Radically simple copy data storage. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from this guy. Um, he said, if you can't explain it simply, um, it's because you don't understand it well enough. And, and I think that there's great truth in that. There is a sort of you know, art and some craft in terms of the ability to, to turn that into something that, um, that resonates with, with you, know, you aren't people who understand the problem. So it's even more acute for you. Um, but, I, but I really believe this. And, and my you know, thing for you to take away is, is I see entrepreneurs and they're afraid to tell it simply, to just say, what is it? Like when I'm working with an entrepreneur, I'll say, just tell me what it is. Like they'll talk for five minutes about an acute, robust platform for the, and I'm just like, I, have, you, I saw your mouth moving, I have no idea what you do. Um, and, and, and it's because we all have this professional persona and we feel like if it's complicated, it's legitimate and it's substantive. Make it simple. Have the courage to make it simple, boil it down to something a 12-year-old can understand. I promise it will accelerate the growth of your business. It's a nirvana. We're wondering why we're not, we don't have 44 billion in revenue yet, <laughs> but uh, we're getting there. Um, like I guess I think uh, uh, career-wise, you've looked at uh, uh, storage companies that have just done an incredible business of piling on more storage to sa save all kinds of data. Um, making, I used to run HP's storage business about uh, six years, seven years ago, you know, six billion dollar business. And uh, there was a very interesting scenario where 50 of the biggest HP's customers used to be brought in for an off-site off retreat. And I had my counterpart who ran the software business, my counterpart who ran the server business, I was a storage guy. And the CIOs would come, people who ran big businesses, would come in and ask this, the software guy, hey, you know, I need some uh, innovation in security, what's your roadmap for the next five years, I'm trying to build this web business. Uh, the server guy would be about, hey, density, you know, processing power, and when it came to the storage guy, it used to be a very simple question. I don't know what you guys do. All I know is my guys are just asking me for more and more budget every quarter. Can you just make this thing free? Because I really can't see the value of this thing. All I know is there's tons of storage being consumed. And that was the starting point. The before story was a very simple exponential growth that just showed that $29 billion of storage in 2013 was bought to store copies of data. $29 billion. In fact, if you look at the numbers, uh, the storage market on the production side is literally half that. And so the ability to take that geometric data growth and come back to doing something meaningful to say my spend on storage is now much better aligned with how my business grows. You know, I have no problem paying for something that I, that I build up my business on. I have a problem when it's non-linear. And that's the part that um, we've, we first you know, come back and talk about. In fact, it becomes less than linear in many cases. The ability to reuse the same data for many things 
allows you to reuse a lot of the same storage for many, many different purposes. So that's, that's the number one. And that solves the problem that I, I was asked uh, by the CIO group maybe eight years ago. So it took me a little while. I'm a little slow, but it took me a little while to come back and address that uh, geometric data growth. Next, next part, do you think um, there's this whole concept? I mean, how all, of, all of you probably you know, dealt with you know, having to pay the you know, health insurance premium or premium for all kinds of auto insurance. And the only goal there is it keeps piling on. In fact, that's the whole notion of the insurance business. It keeps piling on until you have the rainy day that you need this fund for. Now imagine if this insurance actually could work for you, that paid for the school, that paid for taking care of your car, and be able to become an asset, not just something that you pay, hoping the day that it's to be used does not come, or maybe does come. But that's the ability for what we have taken as a, as a liability, as an insurance, as something that is more of a, of a risk that you have to pay for and hope I never have to use, to something that becomes an asset. Hey, I have my backup data. Can I use it to accelerate my SaaS business? We today have a, a SaaS company that, that literally speeds up their development platform, the, dev the release of development by eight times. And imagine if you were a business and I could speed your business by 8x and charge you nothing more than what you did before, that's a hell of a way to convert what used to be an insurance into an asset. Are you speeding time to market for them, literally? In time, to time for... Um, New all innovation. the updates and updates, and, you know, so for a spe especially for a SaaS company, yeah, that's that a big is deal. absolutely what happens. You, get, you take something who being done in 13 weeks down to a few minutes, which brings up the next one. I mean, who the heck wants to wait for hours when I want some information? Now, if, if I want a file, I just lost my file and the old model, I know this, this sounds pretty crazy to people who haven't worked in the enterprise, but the model was you call the IT guy, ask for some file, and somewhere about two weeks later, you, you get your database or file back. Unheard of. Those in the consumer industry want it now. So does the enterprise, too, because businesses don't have the time to wait for days and weeks to get, get the information back. And that ability for us to come back and demonstrate access to information anytime, anywhere, instantly, was a huge difference. In fact, if anything, if you come back and say, hey, I give away my, my existing, my, my competition, if I look at the competition, these are big, massive companies. They could give away the product for free. Now, we just, in, in the reason I'm late here is, you know, we were in the middle of a deal. Our fiscal quarter ends this end of this month. We are competing against a competition that's bid $34 million against us, and we probably end up at about one and a half million, 30 times less. They could give it away. They're big enough. What they cannot do is beat the one part of what it really means to run a business, which is the speed, time. This is the one, one dimension that seems to go only in one direction. And that ability to come back and change the speed at which you access information anywhere, that is probably the, the, what, what Mike would call the killer value proposition. You can literally give away my competition's product. What you cannot do is to come back and make my information available fast enough because you cannot give back time. So then, Ash, just to pause on that, that, that sure. red very clearly spells out something we were talking about earlier, which is it, it's making it obvious that uh, even a company as large as, and I don't know whether it was EMC, but whoever is a big company that's your competitor could give their product away, but they can't do what we do here. And when that happens, the better, faster, cheaper is not even in, in Absolutely. question. Absolutely. And I think you know, most innovations, and uh, this is some slide we, we talk about when we talk at our presentation, most innovations are exactly that. Hey, I do about the same thing, but I'm 10x cheaper. Or I'm about the same price, but I'm 10x faster. This is one of those things, once every so often happens where it's literally on both those dimensions. You are 10x to 20x cheaper, and boy, you're 100x faster than ever before. Now that causes a complete disruption in the market, and that's what we've done. And I think for those who follow the server side, there's some company called VMware that's done that, and I used to, my counterpart used to run the HP server business. The poor guy just lost, I mean, you thought you lost your hair? Oh man, uh, he's completely gone. <coughs> Uh, but decimated the market. So that, that's what happens when uh, software completely takes over what used to be packaged hardware. And uh, the last part, you know, we talked about this, this prison of boxes that the vendors used to come back and, and deliver. You know, I used to sell you a box, and by the way, if you want more of this, you better buy from me, because this box doesn't talk to anybody else. You have to buy more of my stuff, and more of my stuff, until you get to a point where you're so fed up that you decide to take you know, the big shift. 
this ability to come back and change that and provide freedom. I think Mike used to have this phenomenal slide a long time ago. Look, we are dramatically faster, we're dramatically cheaper, and they have this slide of, of, a, of a guy on top of a hill saying, by the way, you're free. You're free from what used to be a prison of uh, vendor dependency. I think all of these, they're hard to think about and you know, usually you try to get it, get it down to one or two things, maybe three things. But I think it's important for paradigm shifting technologies to demonstrate this much bigger things that happen than just one or two things. One of the things that uh, Mike was talking about is a friction of just trying out. Here we are, complex enterprise software, trying to make life easy, and you're trying to make it as easy for yourself as much as you know. You really focus on yourself first before you even worry about the users because you don't know what the users are. We have this enterprise software. You're supposed to download it. <laughs> you're supposed to buy a specific server of the right kind. We gave you the right server uh, spec specs. You buy it. So we would start off the process. You were supposed to download it. Our guy is supposed to come and help you. Two weeks later, our guy shows up. And they still don't have the server. Uh, or they did have it. They bought some cheap one with some memory that was bad. Next thing you know, what started out was supposed to be a two-week two effort. You know, three and a half months into it, they're still trying to putz around figuring out why this thing is not up yet. Because our stuff worked fine in the lab. It's the rest of the environmental stuff that you, you opened up as variables for the user to come back and actually make it work. I mean, you are, you're basically asking the user, you be the integrator. I'll give you all the parts and pieces. Here's the menu. You cook the dish. I think that was a bad lesson because we wasted literally three and a half months as opposed to giving them the entire dish and making it very easy to consume. That is probably the next part of your what it took. I mean, today we do a pilot in one day. You walk in, we've, we've taken an appliance. We did nothing more than what the user was doing except we packaged it nicely. We have a nice little orange bezel that Mike uh, came up with, Actifio Orange as he calls it. And you plug it in, one day you're out of there. Of course, it's three and a half months that it took us for the first time to get going. Huge difference. All the stuff that you talked about in terms of the pain part or the inertia part, just the inability for me to, as a buyer, and by the way, that is the other role I used to play which helped me actually get, you stand up get through this process of being a buyer. I used to be one of the largest storage buyers too. And uh, the inability for me to justify 50% better, eh, big deal. I'm better off staying with my existing guy because it just doesn't make a difference enough for me because the risk of something going wrong uh, is significantly more than just a 50% better pricing or a 50% better improvement of performance. So clearly, uh, I'm not even in the ballpark at that point. Um, so this is the slide we use to articulate gain to the customer, and we do it on the hard dollar uh, side uh, in the slide. And you know we're eliminating a whole bunch of software licenses and hardware. You know you can read the slide. Um, we talk about 10x just on the cost side. So we get the first 10x there without quantifying the value of um, uh, you know how much is it worth? What's an hour of downtime cost you? You know, that question comes up when we produce our TCO ROI analysis, but, but we start the conversation really just on the basis of, of a 90% reduction in TCO. And we can quantify this for the customer after they tell us a little bit more about the money that they're spending today. Um, you know, our strategy to minimize the pain side of the equation, uh, recognizing that this wasn't enough, was uh, to create a whole new class of storage. Um, and you know, I would I would uh, look for you know Ash's commentary on this slide. You know, the one of the other brilliant things they did is they said we don't want to be in a pissing match for the stuff that you're already doing. W the beauty of the copy data idea is it creates something different. We say, look, leave your that's your production data. You just spent you know four million dollars on a Commvault based solution. Good for you. Great product. That's production data. Um, what we do is is copy data. And that's something different, something new. So it, it enabled us to reduce the perceived pain, the perceived switching costs on the part of the, um, of the user. Um, and the beauty of this was that, that it turned out that, the, that copy data was an even better market. Um, as we kind of got behind this idea, uh, we used IDC to go out and, and measure the size of these two markets. And they said, you know, production data is about a $10 billion business, copy data is about a $44 billion business. And by the way, the copy data, because it grows geometrically, that's the downside for the customer. You know, the upside for the business is that's growing at a compound annual growth rate of 23% per year worldwide. So, um, 
you know, this is really, uh, I think, another one of the things that, that uh, the company got right right at the beginning was to reduce the perceived pain, uh, create a totally new category that uh, let them keep what they have in the production side of their business. All the players each have a suite of capabilities, like a stack of things that you have to connect to do what we do alone. So we disrupted not only all the things that they do today, but there were a whole bunch of supporting technologies that came about to mitigate the downside of a flawed 20th century architecture, and we replaced those too. So, you know, this disruptive, you know, comes back to the disruptive business model idea. We took a lot of those functions that people were familiar with and that people think of as separate things, and we showed them how we could do those very same things uh, with a single application. So, um, you know, the, the copy data concept um, really, it does all this for us. It, it really works hard for us. It uh, connects to a blatant customer problem. It establishes this customer priority because it's driving an explosion in storage that's consuming all their resources. Um, it explains the gain in such a way that it's so huge, it actually engenders some cynicism on the part of customers uh, who say, come on, you can't really do that. Uh, the sales process is a process of convincing them we told them the truth in the marketing process. Um, and then we're minimizing pain by leaving their production data alone. So just a recap of how we're putting together some of those, um, uh, those concepts that Michael's been talking about. So I, I talked a little bit about stories and their importance, and great stories have a structure, and the structure we use very much parallels the one uh, that we just took a look at. We think in terms of five components of, of, uh, of really you know, positioning. Target, which is who is the actionable universe of buyers that we're talking to. Segment, which is if I had a room full of those people in the target, what qualifying question would I ask to figure out who's likely to be a customer and who's not? That's the segment. Brand is, is whatever you call yourself. Category is a competitive frame for the buyer, uh, which is a very useful thing. Um, it's very helpful if the buyer, um, if you, it, people say, I, I say, who do you compete with very often to a startup? And they say, no one. And I say, well, shit, that means you're going to need to train people about the problem that you solve. You, know, you want to try to create some category that the buyer understands. Distinction is what makes you unique in that competitive set. Um, proof is perceived evidence of truth uh, to your claim of distinction. So this is a framework that sort of roughly parallels the one that Michael articulated. Uh, it is the one that we, we actually used. And when you string these together, you can articulate any company's value prop um, in a segment, in a, in, in a uh, paragraph that looks like this. For target who are segment, brand provides the category with distinction because of proof. And um, you know, I, can, I can do this for almost any, any uh, company. I will start by saying I hate that word. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's such a glossing over of an incredibly painful and soul-searching process for an entrepreneur to decide what aspects of their original idea to abandon and move on from. So, so but, but with that said, I'd love to get your answer. Yeah, I think the pivot wasn't about uh, the basic concept, the active file versus active feel. Uh, was probably just a simpler way to explain how to say something that uh, uh, was having a hard time uh, for the for the audience. But that apart, uh, the the quote unquote pivot uh, was also not in the product itself. If you look at the, and I can go back to 2008 set of slides that basically says, "Hey, look, people spend a ton more money on making and managing copies of data." What we did change was something that Mike Michael was pointing out to. It's the ability to reduce the friction between what we're building and what the value proposition for the customer is and what, what it took to demonstrate this very, very quickly. We talked about this copy data storage. And somebody really asks us, are you really a storage guy? I said, really? We're enterprise software. But we really package it to look like a storage system because it's a paradigm that all the enterprise guys understand. It's a paradigm that's very easy to haul in, connect power, connect network, and boom, you're done in a day. So that, that part we constantly pivot. And there's more, and by the way, we're not done. You know, we, we have a long way to go as we, and I think we talked about this, uh, much of your innovation in packaging, messaging, value proposition continues to change. And I think uh, that's one thing that definitely needs to change as we understand better, and more importantly, as, a, as the market understands us better. Uh, we couldn't have said we are copy data storage three years ago. They would have said, what the heck is copy data? Then Mike came in, defined the whole space called copy data. Now there are analysts, there are, there are ex external proof that talk about, guys, we should all be managing copy data. It's not us, it's actually analysts talking about that. So there's a bunch of pivoting that we did in terms of packaging, in terms of 
better messaging, but not the fundamental product itself. And enterprise guys are a little tough to pivot. You know, consumer markets are a, a little different story. Uh, there's a lot of deep-rooted uh, market analysis we do before we jump into this game. So this was it. For enterprises managing lots of production data, Actifio Copy Data Management provides access to anything instantly because it's radically simple. Um, and, and that was it. Everything that we've, we've done is really based on that articulation in those buckets, and um, it's been a guidepost for, for everything that's followed. You know, it was very gratifying to hear Gartner say that, um, but it, it was you know, a year and a half of hard work, starting with a simple story and then focusing on quality of execution.